Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Okay, so um, thank you for pulling the slides up. So we're going to be discussing today um, a subject matter that we're very familiar with in the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, which is the chanting of the holy names, but we'll, we'll do it through a particular lens, um, a very interesting approach to the chanting and this approach will be looking at our chanting in relation to the process of creation how we became entangled in the material world and how through the chanting let me get the slides back and how through the chanting we can reverse that process so um, we'll be talking about the four levels of sound and also relating it to what we call the internal dialogue. So to begin with, we're going to read um, some sections of the Srimad Bhagavatam, and then we will take the discussion further on from there. So, this is um, Bhagavatam, First Canto, actually no, I'll read this one first. This is Bhagavatam, Third Canto, Chapter 26, Text Number 32. Okay. I've got the printout, but I'm going to read it from another source. It's the free Tamasakcha vikuvanat Bhagavat viyakoditat Shabdamatram abutasman Nabaha shotam tu shabdagam Okay, so this is Bhagavatam, as we said, 3.26.32 And the... I will do it word for word. I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. Tamasat... From egoism in ignorance. ignorance. Cha Cha. and And. Vikuvanat Vikuvanat. undergoing transformation. transformation. Bhagavat Virya Virya. by the energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Godhead. Koditat impelled. Shabda Matram, the subtle element. Sorry, the subtle element sound. Abut was manifested. Tasmat from that. Nabaha ether. Shrotram the sense of hearing. To then. Shabdagam, which catches sound. Translation and purple by His Divine Grace, Shula AC. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shula Prabhupada, Shula Prabhupada Ki Jai. When egoism and ignorance is agitated by the sex energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the subtle element sound is manifested. And from sound comes the ethereal sky and the sense of hearing. Purple. It appears from this verse that all the objects of our sense gratification are are the products of egoism in ignorance. 
It is understood from this verse that by agitation of the element of egoism and ignorance, the first thing produced was what? Sound. Which is a subtle form of ether. It is stated also in the Vedanta Sutra that sound is the origin of all the objects of material possession. And this is most important. And that by sound, one can also dissolve this material existence. Anavriti Shabdat means liberation by sound. The entire material manifestation began from sound. And sound can also end material entanglement if it has a particular potency. The particular sound capable of doing this is the transcendental vibration, Hare Krishna. Our entanglement in material affairs has begun from material sound. Now we must purify that sound in spiritual understanding. There is sound in the spiritual world also. If we approach that sound, then our spiritual life begins and the other requirements for spiritual advancement can be supplied. We have to understand very clearly that sound is the beginning of the creation of all material objects for our sense gratification. Similarly, if sound is purified, our spiritual necessities are, um, also are produced from sound. Here it is said that from sound the ether became manifested and that the air became manifested from ether. How the ethereal sky comes from sound, how the air comes from, from sky and how fire comes from air will be explained later on. Sound is the cause of the sky and sky is the cause of shrotrum, the ear. The ear is the first sense for receiving knowledge. One must give oral reception to any knowledge one wants to receive, either material or spiritual. Therefore, Shrotram is very important. The Vedic knowledge is called Shruti. Knowledge has to be received by hearing. By hearing only can we have access to either material or spiritual enjoyment. Okay. So I'll stop there and we'll come to another verse a bit later on. So what we're going to touch upon to begin with is some key points from the purport that we just read. And as we said, this is an instructional purport by Srila Prabhupada. He talks about this term being liberated by sound. And he specifically says that that sound vibration that can liberate us is the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. He says in this purple, now we must purify that sound in spiritual understanding. And he also says our spiritual necessities also are produced from sound. Okay? So what we're going to be looking at are some key aspects of this particular verse in purple. And then we're going to take you on a journey. A journey to explore the different dimensions of chanting the holy names. To begin this journey, I'm also going to share with you a story from the Vedas. So in Bhagavatam, it mentions the killing of Vritrasura. Who's familiar with that particular pastime? Okay, the majority of you. So Vritrasura, in his previous life, was who? Chitraketu Maharaj. Okay. And he was cursed to become this demon. And Vritrasura... Um, was in battle with the demigods, in particular Indra. And he's killed by Indra. Now, the Bhagavatam talks about this pastime, but there are other Shastras which kind of elaborate some of the fine points to this. So it's explained that after the killing of Vitrasura, the demigods were actually hiding nearby, because they were very fearful of this person, this demon. And they wanted to... They wanted someone to go and check that he was definitely dead. Okay? And so eventually Vayu, Vayu said, okay, I will, I'm prepared to go and check to make sure he's dead. But I'll do it on one condition. If I check that he's dead, 
then in exchange for me checking, I should be given somaras. Somaras is a heavenly beverage. And so the demigod said, okay, you go and check he's dead, come back, confirm, and you'll get somaras. So, um, Vayu went to check, checked the body of Vichasura, confirmed it was dead. He came back and said, all right, he's, he's definitely dead, don't worry. Now, give me somaras. At that point, Indra spoke up. And he had a complaint. He said, look, this, this doesn't make any sense. I did all the work. I killed him. He just checked that he was dead. Yeah? So I should get the somaras, not him. So they couldn't actually agree. Yeah? So they took it to a higher authority. Actually, I can't remember who it was right now. Mine's gone blank on that. But the, the decision was made that they should share the somaras. So Vayu, being very quick, he went first. Yeah? In fact, one other point. So it was decided that they should share it. But the demigod said to Indra, if we, if we share, if we, if we let you both share the somaras, what do we get? And Indra said to me, he said, I will make your speech distinct. Okay, that's what Indra said. You give me some of us, I will make your speech distinct. So then Vayu took the Samaras first. But Vayu, he drank three quarters of the Samaras. So when it came to Indra, Indra was, he was very upset. He was very upset that only one quarter of the Samaras had been left for him. And he said, because you only gave me one quarter, from this point on, only one quarter of your speech shall be distinct. Yeah? So in the Shastra, it's explained that there are actually four levels of sound. Not one, but there's actually four. One is distinct, and the other three are hidden. And we're going to explore in this seminar these four different levels of sound. Yeah? We're going to explore what they mean, and most importantly, we're going to explore how they relate to the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. Now, to begin with, what I'm going to do is touch upon uh, a key point that Krishna makes to Uddhava in the 11th canto of, of the Bhagavatam. So he explains so many things to Uddhava. And Uddhava says, okay, can you just give me something specific? Can you give me some specific instruction? Because there's so much knowledge that he's giving. And Krishna talks about how, basically, he says, I become manifested in the sound vibration of the Vedas. Okay? I become manifested in the sound vibration of the Vedas. Specifically in the Shastra, it is explained that at the time of creation, what actually happened was the Lord entered into the root chakra. Um, it's called the Muladhara chakra of Lord Brahma. And then he went up to the navel chakra and then through to the roof of the mouth and then out to the mouth of Lord Brahma. And that sound that came out of Lord Brahma's mouth was the Vedic sounds. Now there's one reference in the Vishnu Purana 1534 that the sounds that were spoken by Lord Brahma were, were the actual objects. So the Lord Brahma being empowered by, the, by Krishna, when he spoke, that was the manifestation of those particular objects. Okay? So creation comes through sound. And actually, we are co-creators. So by our, our use of sound, we are also having an effect upon the day-to-day -day lives that we are living as individuals, as devotees as well. We talked about the entanglement of the living entity. So one way we can look at this, or a way of looking at this, is that someone is in the, in the spiritual sky. And at a particular point, that soul cries out in a certain way. And what is that cry? That cry is, I want to be the enjoyer. I want to enjoy. Krishna is the original enjoyer, but at the end, that, that soul says, I want to be the enjoyer. The cry of the soul is an extremely powerful sound vibration. 
It's an extremely powerful vibration. And that cry manifests a certain desire, which brings us into material existence. Okay? This is where it begins. Enjoying, though, is vague. So when the soul cries out that it wants to enjoy, it becomes covered by the intelligence. Okay? So the soul has a voice. That voice is called paravak. Yeah? Transcendental sound. When that call to enjoy or to be the enjoyer comes, it then becomes covered by the intelligence. The intelligence has a certain function. Intelligence gives some direction to how the soul wants to enjoy. Okay? So saying that I want to be the enjoyer is vague. The intelligence starts to make that more specific. So, in the material world, for example, someone wants to enjoy it, but then when it becomes more specific, they may want to enjoy it by being a doctor, or they may want to enjoy it by being um, the head of an organization, whatever it is. So the intelligence brings some more specificity or some more um, preciseness to the desire to enjoy. And that voice of the intelligence is called pasyantivak. Yeah? Pasyanti literally means to see. Yeah? Pasyantivak. To give an analogy, when you are, um, let's say you're involved in, in planning or organizing something, or you're head of an organization, they start with the vision of the organization. Okay? What's our vision? What's our overall goal? Then from there, they start to work back to some more of the details. So the vision is actually pasyantivak. Yeah? And we'll explain how that relates to chanting as we go through the seminar. So, that vision or that pasyantivak also relates to a particular energy of the Lord. And the energy it relates to is the energy of desire. And the Sanskrit word for this is icha shakti. Okay? The icha shakti. So pasyantivak, the sound at the level of the intelligence relates to what we call icha shakti, the desire, the energy of desire. Okay. As that desire goes further down, becomes more gross, it becomes covered by the mind. Okay. Now what the mind does is it, it starts to give almost like the, the sub-goals. So if you have a vision, you know, where you, you know what you want to achieve, then the steps that you're going to take to achieve that vision, that kind of understanding, that's coming from the level of the mind. The mind also has a voice. The voice of the mind is called Madhyamavak. Madhyam means middle. Okay? And the Madhyamavak also has a certain energy that relates to it. And that is called Jnana Shakti. Yep. The energy of knowledge. And we'll, again, we'll explain how these relate to the chanting as we go on. So again, with the, Icha, with the Icha Shakti, at the level of the intelligence, you have a vision. Then you start to put some more concrete goals around the vision. Okay? So for example, let's say that the overall vision was to make more devotees. But when it comes to the next level, you would say something like, we want to have 10 new people attending all of our programs every week. Okay, so it's become even more deliberate, more clear, or more concrete. Okay, so, the last step. So let's go back. First of all, you have the sound of the soul, saying that I want to be the enjoyer. Then it gets covered by the intelligence. The intelligence has a voice, so it's how it wants to enjoy. Then it comes down to the madhyamavak, the sound of the, of the mind, which gives some specific steps to how we're going to enjoy. The last level, and this is called Vaikarivak, is the gross sound that you hear. Okay? The gross sound that you hear. And the Madhyamavak, so Madhyamavak is when the mind is speaking, Vaikarivak is, is the level of the body. Okay? So in this world, we hear each other's physical voices. We hear what each other is saying. And also, we chant with the lips. 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So the process of recreation and reversing this process aligns perfectly with the process of, of advancement, excuse me, in chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And as you go through this, you can get a sense of where you are on that particular journey as well. And we'll relate what happens at each of these different stages in terms of the chanting of the holy names as well. Okay. So, the last level, as we said before, is the level of the body. And that means that just in a general sense, we make some statement, we make some command, do this, do that, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. So the energy that relates to the Vaikari Vak, the most gross or the gross sound, that is called Kriya Shakti. The energy of action. Just like in the world, you want someone to do something, you say, move. So you use your gross voice and there's some physical movement or physical reaction. Okay. And the more that we use that gross sound, the more we become entangled in the material world. Unless it's utilized in in the specific way. As Prabhupada says here, now we must purify that sound in spiritual understanding. So at this point, when sound is used for a material purpose, it actually causes the living entity to become more entangled in the material world. And the opposite is also true. When sound is used for a spiritual purpose, it is actually the cause of one's liberation from the material energy and also from the bodily identification. Okay. So, the point is to chant and to chant in a, in a higher way. So we're going to talk about what it feels like to, to chant at some of these different levels. So for this exercise, I want you to do something for me. We're going to chant together, okay? But I want you to chant in a specific way. And, and some of us may be more familiar with this type of chanting than others. But I want you, we're going to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra But while we're chanting, I want you to deliberately think of something other than the sound vibration. I know it may be unfamiliar to many of us in the room, but try your best, okay? Okay. So after three. One, two, three. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Okay. And it's interesting, you can even pick it up in the way that you hear the sound how disjointed that sound vibration is. What, what we've chanted just then, that is specifically Vaikari Vak. Gross sound. When the lips are chanting, but the mind is actually doing something else. Yeah? Now, at the same time, that's the beginning stage of the journey. Yeah? But the idea in Krishna consciousness is that's our entry point but over time and with practice, we're meant to move beyond the Vaikari Vak. So Prabhupada will sometimes t- say, Takshrinu, just here. He quotes Krishna who says that to Arjuna. And by that, sa- by that hearing, which is meant to be attentive, you start to move on this journey. And in the perfect stage, we come to what we call Paravak. It's interesting. When you hear Prabhupada chanting, when you hear a recording of Prabhupada chanting, as, you go through, as we go through this seminar, you'll be able to understand that when he's chanting, that is the soul chanting. That's why it talks about the, the, the chanting of a pure devotee, because it may externally seem the same, but it's not the same. That's when the conditioned soul is chanting. Yeah? He's not chanting at the level of Vaikari Vak. When Prabhupada or any pure devotee is chanting, they're chanting on the level of Paravak. It is actually pure, unadulterated, transcendental sound. Okay, so that Vaikarivak is also offensive chanting. 
Okay, so Vaikari Vak, although it's the beginning point, it is Nama Parat, right? chanting in the offensive way. Because we're only giving lip service to the chanting, but the mind, as we said before, the mind has a sound vibration. The mind has a voice. And what happens in, in the first stage is that the lips are saying, Dear energy of the Lord, dear Lord, do what? What's the translation? Dear energy of the Lord, dear Lord, please engage me in your devotional service, right? Interesting. But the mind, the intelligence could be saying, you know what, I would love to be the center of attention. You know what, I wonder what's for breakfast. You know, I'm really bored. And it's interesting one of the points which are made about the holy name is it, 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 it can fulfill all desires. And it does. See, if someone's chanting attentively, that desire will be fulfilled. That desire is, please allow me to be your pure servant. If someone is chanting inattentively, then even though one quarter of the speech is saying one thing, because the other levels of the transcendental of the sound is saying something else, the Supreme Lord sees or hears the entire dialogue. So all of us have an internal dialogue. We say one thing with our lips, but the other levels can be saying something different and Krishna is hearing the entire thing. Hmm? And that is why some difficulties come in our spiritual path also. Because if the, if the, if the journey isn't progressive we may get something that we're asking for that we're not even conscious of. Okay. So what we've chanted is Vaikari Vak. Let's move on. So, at Vaikari Vak, we're not really asking for service. The lips, are, the body's asking for service, but so much more of the self is asking for something completely different. Vaikari Vak relates to the earlier stages of the eight stages of advancement. So Vaikaravak relates to Shraddha, Sadhu Sangha and Bhajana Kriya. Okay? But it also, that Vaikaravak, if it's done progressively, moves the devotee, moves the chanter. If they're chanting at Vaikaravak progressively, it moves them forward to Anatta Nivriti. Okay? It's actually a progressive thing if it's done properly. Okay? It also relates to a stage of what we call Maya Smaranam. So you can tell that you're chanting at Vaikari Vak if you're absorbed in Maya. <laughs> in other words, if we're thinking constantly about mundane things. Yeah? Maya Smaranam. That means we're chanting at Nam Aparad, we're chanting at Vaikari Vak. Okay. It also relates to the level of the gross body, and in terms of the yoga ladder, it relates to karma yoga. Okay? More activity done with the gross physical body. It also relates to the element of earth. So it's the most gross of all the elements. Okay. And it can also be perceived more that that, that that level, it's more about the engagement of the gross physical body in service, running around doing so many things. Okay. But if it's done properly, it helps to purify the devotee and they move up. So if we chant with the lips properly, but, we're, but properly means that you're attentive. So you try to engage your mind in hearing that sound vibration. Then what happens is the chanting and the progress moves to the level of Madhyamavak. Okay, so for this, I want us to do the following. Um, okay, so, can we... Yes, what's the best way to do this? Okay. I want you to, I think quite a few of you have your mobile phones. If you don't have your mobile phones, I'd like you to just write the, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra on, on a notepad or pen or bring it up on your mobile phone so you can see it. Okay? If you could do that for me. Yep, it's there, but I don't think everyone can, oh, okay, can everyone... Can everyone see in the room the, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra somewhere? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'd like you to be able to see it. Okay, good. So, for this, for this next level, what I'd like you to do is follows. We're going to chant the mantra together. But what I'd like you to do for this 
is I'd like you to chant the mantra and I'd like you to read the mantra at the same time. Okay? And hear it as well. Okay? So you're reading it, you're chanting it with your lips, and also you're hearing that chanting. Okay? Is everyone clear on that? Okay. And we'll do this together at the same pace. So you're reading it, you're hearing it, and you're chanting it with your lips. Okay, so after three. One, two, three. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. One more time. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. One more time. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Pause. Okay. So that chanting, where you are using your lips to chant them, that vibration. You're reading it so your mind is engaged. And you are hearing it attentively. If you were able to chant like that all the time, you're chanting and you will be on the platform of Nishta. Okay? That's, that is how it feels to chant at Madhyamavak. Okay? So the mind is fully engaged in the chanting. One can hear it steadily and you know the, the lips are engaged. Okay? So that is the level of Madhyamavak. That is, that is the level of attentive chanting. And when one comes to the platform of Nishta, one is actually liberated. Liberation isn't the goal of devotional life. Liberation happens at nishta, done. Yeah? So if you were able to chant at that level where the mind is fully captured by the chanting consistently, then you should know that that is an indication from the chanting perspective that you've come to the platform of nishta bhakti. Okay? Okay. A few other points on this. Um, when one chants at the level of madhyamavak, it starts to affect your desires. Yeah? So when one chants at this level, it affects your desires and your desires start to change and it actually starts to reawaken your spiritual desires. Okay? As well. And a very interesting correlation to this. At this stage, um, this, this Madhyamavak relates to what we call the Jnana Shakti. So you start to get a tremendous amount of real knowledge. Spiritual knowledge. Not mat- it doesn't mean material information or facts, but an analogy that's given in the Shastra, and this is what Krishna speaks to Uddhava about. He talks to him about the... Um, I'll read it to you, actually. This is a purport. He says, uh, let's see. As from the wood... or No, this is a purport by Prabhupada, but he gives this particular point. As from the wood... The infested fire can be manifested by proper manipulation, or as butter can be churned out of the milk, so also the presence of the Lord as Paramatma can be felt by the process of legitimate hearing and chanting of the transcendental subject. Okay? So, the analogy that Krishna uses in the 11th canto is that by rud being together firewood, you first, you, you start to see the, the smoke and then a spark, and then it becomes a blaze of fire. So the smoke relates to the purification process, right? Because as you're trying to become purified, all the unwanted things, all the anatas come up first. The spark relates to Madhyamavak, okay? The spark, that spark, that light, that light starts to allow someone to see things more clearly. Okay? So therefore, it relates to the Madhyamavak, it relates to the Jnana Shakti, it relates to the awakening of spiritual knowledge, which allows one to see everything clearly and to understand things more clearly. Okay? Um, so, in other words, everything lights up for the devotee. They become more and more increasingly enlightened. Now, 
as the chanting improves and goes deeper, it comes to the level of the intelligence which is pasyantivak. And that level, as we said before, is, the, is related to what we call the Icha Shakti. So one's spiritual desires are really strongly awakened in this way. So when one is chanting at this level, actually, we'll, we'll talk about what that's like in a moment. Let's do, this ex- let's do this little experiment and application first. For this, what I'm going to ask is, can we go to the next slide, please? If you actually this okay, and then do that again, please. Okay. So for this chanting, what I'd like you to do is look at the picture of Krishna. Okay. I'd like you to look at the picture of Krishna, and I'd like you to try and get a mental image of that picture of Krishna. Just take your time to do this. Get a mental image of the picture of Krishna. And in a moment, what I'm going to ask you to do, in a moment, but not just yet, I'm going to ask you in a moment to hold the image clearly in your mind. But, while holding the image in your mind, I'm going to ask you to look at the Maha Mantra. So you're going to have this in your mind, but you're going to look at the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, and you're going to say the mantra in your mind, and you're going to chant the mantra with your lips. Okay, it's a little bit more complex, but I'm going to ask you to try that. Okay, so you're going to internalize this picture. You're going to hold that in your mind. While looking at the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, you're going to chant with your lips, and you're going to read the mantra that you're looking at in terms of the Hare Krishna Mantra. Is that clear as an activity? All I want you to do is once, reading the mantra once through, okay? So inside yourself you should see this. Outside yourself you should see the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Listen to the sound of yourself chanting and chant out loud with your lips, okay? Again, after three. One, two, three. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. Once again, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Pause. So in the in this level, we asked you to internalize that picture. So in your mind, you saw this beautiful beautiful cowherd boy Krishna but you were reading the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra your external senses were seeing that and you were hearing with your ears the sound vibration the holy name if you were able to do this constantly in other words if you were able to attentively hear while at the same time internally seeing the form of the Lord in your mind consistently, that means you're chanting at the level of Pasyantivak. Okay? That's chanting at the level of the intelligence. A few things on this. So, when you're chanting at this level, the, the Smaranam is twofold. It is Rupa and Guna Smaranam. Yeah? So you're remembering the rupa, the form of the Lord, and you can remembering the qualities of the Lord. And it's also sometimes said, so you'll, at this stage you'll also be thinking of service to the Lord. You'll be meditating on, on offering some service to the Lord as well. Okay? So that relates to the level of pasyantivak. That is when one is chanting at the level of the intelligence. Okay. And it's just on that particular point, you know, Prabhupada, there's a class he gave, in, it was in Geneva. And he was talking, he said that chanting means that you're seeing Krishna, and he talks about seeing Krishna on the throne, and you're bathing him with holy waters, and you're rendering service. He actually talks about that particular point. So, interestingly enough, also, when Prabhupada is talking in classes about chanting, 
This is a mistake that often devotees make. We hear different statements by Prabhupada and we don't recognize the entire range of statements. So sometimes Prabhupada says just here. And that's useful and it's true. But there's also other places where Prabhupada will say different things. Just hearing is your foot in the door. It's the beginning stages. And it's a safe thing to say. But sometimes when Prabhupada will speak to different people, depending on where they are in their spiritual journey, he would say different things also to them. And it's interesting, once you know this science, when you look at Prabhupada's statements about chanting, you'll be able to tell, is he talking about Vaikari Vak? Just the first stage, chanting with your lips to make the progressive journey. Is he speaking about Madhyama Vak? Is he speaking about Pasyanti Vak? Or is he speaking about the pure stage of chanting? When Prabhupada says, we should call out to the Lord just like a young child calling out to their mother, that's Paravak. Yep, that's the cry of the soul. Yeah? So he's asking us to practice that. Because also when you practice that, you'll come closer to that. Yeah? So different statements in our Shastra relate to different levels of chanting actually. Yep. But they're all meant to be progressive in our journey in Krishna consciousness. Okay. So when you let's go back a stage at Madhyama Vak, when you chant at the level of the mind, the meditation is called Nam Smaranam. And you may have experienced this from time to time. Sometimes you're in a good kirtan and then throughout the day you're hearing that kirtan. Right? Yep. If you were always in that level where you were always hearing the vibration of the holy name, that's Nam Smaranam. I know one devotee friend of mine, and he wrote to his spiritual master, and he told him that, um, that he was having this experience where sometimes he would spontaneously hear his own mind chanting. Yep. That, that means he's chanting at Madhyama Vak. Yep. Because, and it's beautiful to know this. The re- one of the reasons why we're doing these kinds of seminars is we want to take things from the philosophical level so that you can, be, you can be spiritual scientists. As spiritual scientists, you will actually be able, through symptoms, you'll be able to, to scientifically understand where you are in the chanting and where other people are in their chanting also. Yeah? We, we were explaining, we gave a class. First of all, when's class meant to finish? 6.30. Okay, so we'll, we'll round this very soon. We were talking about how, in, and proper mentions this in Krishna book part one, there are what's, what we call the 64 arts that Krishna and Balaram learned when they were in the Gurukul of Sandipani Muni. And one of them is called Nimitta Gyan. Um, it's literally like the science of omens. But you can take that principle further. And that is that at every level of consciousness or different levels of chanting, they all have their own symptoms. Right? They all have their own signs. So when you understand what the signs are at different levels, then you can understand where you are or where others are on that particular journey. Yeah? So sometimes gurus, they'll speak to disciples and, they'll, and they'll, the disciple will explain to their spiritual master, Guru Maharaj, I'm experiencing this. And because he's conversant with the Shastra, he understands that if they're experiencing this consistently, it means that they are at this stage in their spiritual journey. Yeah? Because everything has its own specific symptoms. And then he will give guidance accordingly based upon their specific level of progress. Okay, you're at this point in the journey, so for you to take the next stage, you need to be doing X, Y, and Z. Yeah? It really, it really is a transcendental science. Yeah? So by learning this, you can understand how to move forward. Okay, I'll just say a few more points on this particular aspect. So at, as we said, the Madhyamavad, it's the mind who's also chanting. The mind's chanting, the lips are chanting. Therefore this absorption and therefore this progress. At Pasyantivak, we mentioned that you, can reform, you tend to recall the form and the qualities of the Supreme Lord. Okay, and we mentioned that additional point. Now... If you're not at the level of a Shakti, what happens is every now and then you may get a taste of this. You may have this, what we said, Madhyam, um, this Pasyanti Vak experience where you remember the form of the Lord and you're also able to hear attentively and so on. But if you're at a Shakti, that's consistent. At a Shakti, you have the, you have the remembrance of the form, the qualities, you can hear the sound vibration, etc. Yep. 
Before that, you will not have this experience consistently. That's also the other thing to remember about spiritual life. Every now and then you can get a taste of some higher level of spiritual progress. But the level that we are on is a level that you consistently experience. Do you understand that point? So, when, so even when we talk about how someone got some, some special mercy, yes. You may, have, you may have had experience where at one point you may have chanted. One day you were chanting and spontaneously the form came. And you were remembering Krishna's form. And you were hearing it. It was very blissful. And then the next day it went back to normal <laughs> again. Yeah. 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 Very interesting. So we, we sometimes, by the mercy of the devotees, by the mercy of the Lord, get a taste of different levels of spiritual progress. But we don't necessarily stay there. Okay, that's how science works. Okay. But the point is that if we keep making progress in our spiritual practice, Krishna will see that you're making progress, and he'll see, he'll see that you're endeavoring, sorry. And because he sees that you're consistently endeavoring, he will give you mercy and that will move you forward. Okay. So, also in addition, when one comes to Paravak, because it's like the blazing fire, at Paravak, you come to what we call Leela Smaranam. So at Paravak, you remember, you remember Krishna's pastimes, you're absorbed in Krishna's pastimes, you're absorbed in your, in your service, or your um, engagement in Krishna's pastimes, and as Srimad Bhagavatam, in Bhagavatam 4th Canto, chapter 22, text number 26, it talks about how it, one, one becomes awakened in that sense to the pastimes of the Lord and literally the material body and the material identity becomes dissolved. Okay? So no, you're no longer thinking, I am this body. You actually realize it as, your, as, an, as an eternal Servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Okay, so the material body and the material mind are literally um, dissolved in that particular way. Okay, so I guess we've made a few comments here. That is how the stages or the progression of the chanting takes place. It starts with the gross sound, and as one pays attention to that gross sound, the sound becomes more internalized, madhyamavak, chanting not just with the lips but with the mind. As one becomes further progressive in that chanting, it comes to the level of the intelligence, the pasyantivak, yeah? where one is able to hear the sound vibration, the mind is absorbed, the form, the rupa and the guna of the, of the Lord also become manifest. And in the pure stage beyond pasyantivak, that is the chanting at the level of the soul. There's really no exercise you can do for that. Yeah? That is something that you have to experience by, by the progression. A few other points. Can I go over five minutes? or yes. Is that okay? Yes? yes. Okay. Because there's a few other things we, wanna, we want to talk about here. So, it's very interesting. There is one place in which Prabhupada talks about how Krishna is not partial. He says everything depends upon one's own personal practice. So there is one statement there which says that you have to endeavor for this. But interestingly enough, there is, there is another place where Prabhupada says, it is not by the mechanical process of hearing and chanting, everything depends upon mercy, basically. The mercy of the spiritual master, the mercy of Krishna. So both things are absolutely necessary. And the two things are reconciled in 10th Canto Bhagavatam, in Damodar Leela. In Damodar Leela, we see that Mother Yashoda wants to bind Krishna. And she goes to great lengths to bind Krishna. So if she gets all the rope from her own house in order to bind Krishna. Is it enough? No. She then gathers up all the rope from her friend's house. Is it enough to bind Krishna? No. What happens is that Krishna, and she's actually sweating. It's actually interesting. In, in, in the Shastra, it says the demigods do not sweat. The demigods don't actually sweat. But the residents of Vrindavan, you show the Maya, she's sweating. She's endeavoring so hard. But at a particular point, Krishna decides to be merciful and he allows himself to be bound. So in our process of chanting, the endeavor has to be made 
but the endeavor is to attract mercy, and when the mercy descends, then our chanting will be perfected. Then we will come to that platform of chanting at Paravak. That is the chanting actually of the soul, beyond even just the physical body, the mind, the intelligence, etc. Okay. So these are just some considerations around the chanting of the holy names. Okay. It allows us to understand where we are. It allows you to even understand those times where you've experienced some mercy, where you experienced chanting of a higher nature. You can also see where was that chanting? What level? Was that just a gross physical lips? Was it that the mind was chanting? You may have sometimes experienced your mind was just chanting, Nam Smaranam. You're going around in your day, you're hearing Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Nam Smaranam. Okay, yes. So when I had that experience, that meant at that time, it was Madhyamavak. Yeah? Chanting at the level of the mind. There may have been some times in your day or in your, in your Krishna conscious life, you were chanting and you could actually remember the Lord's form the deity's form, the Lord's form, and you remember that in your mind while you were chanting, while chanting attentively. That was Pasyanti Vak. Yeah? So our day-to-day -day experience indicates where we are on this particular journey. And if you understand this and consciously practice this, you'll be able to move forward very, very quickly in your spiritual process. Yeah? very quickly by knowing where you are and what you need to move forward the other benefit of knowing this is that when you're dealing with others new or experienced devotees you can understand where they are in their journey of chanting and then you can give them direction or guidance accordingly to help them to move forward okay but the key point is that in all in all situations the most powerful thing is to try to chant attentively. Okay, maybe tomorrow in the class we'll, we'll talk about the, the unique combinations that everyone has. We've been, we've been thinking a lot about how spiritual life is unique for each and every one of us. We've all come in with different types of karma. We all presently have a different nature. So what helps you to unlock your chanting is not, is not necessarily the same thing that's going to be most useful. Everything can be useful. But it won't be necessarily the same thing that's going to be most effective for another person to unlock their chanting. And this is based upon a statement by Prabhupada where he talks about the, the, devotion, the ninefold devotional service and how it can take place in different modes. Anyone heard that before? Yes. I think it's mentioned in Nectar of Devotion as well. I think it's, well, it's definitely mentioned in Bhagavatam. So we have nine limbs. Nava Anga Bhakti, the ninefold process beginning with hearing, chanting, etc. But each of these can be done in different modes. And then each of those can be done in sub-modes. So we'll touch a bit more about that tomorrow. Because what we want to do is start us on a journey. It's a real journey, but it's on a journey of personalizing our Krishna consciousness. Starting to... to Prabhupada says we, our movement is transcendental personalism. But we don't always act that way. So what we're trying to do in this journey is think, what particularly helps me to chant? For one person, they may get, find that they get very absorbed when they're sitting before the deity, looking at the form of the Lord and chanting, and it particularly helps their mind to be focused. For someone else, they find that the way that they get particularly focused is if they do prayers in the beginning. That particularly affects them and helps their mind to be less crazy, to be more absorbed. For someone else, it may be that they um, find that when they read something and reflect on something about the Holy Name before they start chanting, that really helps them to get focused. What we're going to try and explore tomorrow is what is that unique combination that works for you in your chanting so we can move forward on our particular journey. Okay, so I think we'll stop there. Thank you very much. Are there any questions before we close? I saw... <laughs>
How much time do we have for questions? I don't want to go over time because I know I'm conscious of RT and different things. So first of all, what's, what's the limit? Because then I'll, I can take questions accordingly. What's, when do we have to end in Q, including questions? Because I can see it's 22 right now. How long do we have? Five minutes, ten minutes? Second class is seven o'clock. Second class is seven o'clock. Okay. And okay, that's, that's, then in that case, let's, yeah, let's start here. Thank you. Okay, then pass the microphone. Thank you for your class. Uh, I have a question. You spoke about uh, remembering the Lord and having the you know, vision of the Lord in the heart. I was reflecting many Prabhupada disciples. Uh, I've seen many leaving the body, and often they'll meditate, they'll tell us, bring us picture from Śrīla Prabhupada. Let's, let's see Śrīla Prabhupada last. Mm. So I was reflecting how important it is that we remember spiritual master while chanting, how beneficial it is that we remember his form he maybe look at his picture when he, when we're chanting or uh, remembering his instructions. Where is this level at? So, in terms of remembrance of the spiritual master, I'm just I'm just processing this in my mind. <laughs> well, I'm recalling when you're asking this question. To be honest, is I recall my spiritual master sitting before his guru. I'm recalling my spiritual master sitting before Prabhupada and chanting. And he would have a very strong um, meditation, which he actually shared with one of his god brothers who, who shared that. And that is, um, it's a little bit of an intense meditation, so you won't, me- you won't mention a few people know the specific meditation, we won't go into that. But the point I would say is that um, I'm actually not sure what level that's at. I'm not sure. I was thinking that it may be at Pasyantivak, because there's a form there. But I will have to. I will confer with. I will confer with some seniors before we say that. But you, it is. A, it is a practice you can do. Yeah. But the main thing is to hear the name. Yeah. And and you can tell that the practice is appropriate for you if it allows you to hear the name better. That's the litmus test. If it becomes a distraction, then it, it means you're, you're doing a practice which, you're, which is not beneficial for us at our stage in our journey. I think that's the key thing that they'd want me to convey. Is that okay? Okay. Thank you. Good question. Who else had their hands up? Okay. All right, what we'll do is we'll take something from the lady's side and then we'll come back. Is that okay? Just to make sure everyone has a chance to, to ask a question. So this, they're just going to pass the microphone over. <coughs> Hare Krishna Prabhu, very nice class. Thank you so much. Just want to ask you that, um, you know, when you have these stages, mm-hmm. is it possible that you skip one of the stages, such as uh, Madhyanta work, ma work, in that when you have when you have mind and mantra is on your lips, is it possible you just remember the form and sometime maybe just when you're in front of the deities and Kirtan is so nice and beautifully mm-hmm. just crying and just you don't know anything, you're not saying anything. Is it is it possible to just skip the that won't be chanting, would it? Is it is right, so let's answer your question very directly. It is possible. Generally, it doesn't happen, but I'll explain what happens. Generally, we move through the stages. Sometimes, when an individual has a, a lot of adhikar from a previous life, yeah, then they and even then, what they tend to do is move very quickly through certain stages to others. Yeah, that can happen, or in rare cases, they may skip. And it's because of a, a huge amount of practice or a lot of adhikar, qualification from a previous life, generally. But what, what happens for the majority of us is that we move through the, through the different stages. Although, as I said before, by the mercy of the Vaishnavas, by the mercy of the Holy Name, by the mercy of Guru, sometimes we may jump to get a taste of, some, of, of what the chanting is like at a higher level. And then we may go back to the level that we're normally at. So sometimes people have an experience of a level beyond their day-to-day, their actual level of advancement. But you can tell what the level that someone is at is by the experience they have consistently. Yeah? Does that answer your question? Thank, Thank, you, Thank you so you. much. Good question. Who's take, moving the microphone? Yeah, okay. So let's... We'll do one more here, then we'll go there. Um, maybe this lady... Uh, 
Thank you, Bhattavarana Prabhu. Uh, I was wondering on Paravak level, you mentioned that um, uh, it's not only Nama uh, Rupa Guna, but it's also Lila. And uh, I was wondering, is it uh, we spontaneously remember Lilas from Bhagavatam, or we actually enter the Lilas? Actually, both. Both. <laughs> Okay. You spontaneously remember the past times, and you're absorbed in your mm. in your um, relationship. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So okay, no worries. If we could pass it back this way, who had the question on the men's? Side? Okay, we just. Oh, probably this well. Okay. <laughs> Okay, it's a very short one. Uh, you spoke about Vritrasura story, Sorry? the story of Vritrasura. Vritrasura. Yes, and uh, about certain scriptures that get more into the details. Which ones? So scriptures that get more into... Oh, I can give you the quote. I don't have the specific reference of that pastime. It's a pastime that I will share with you, but I can give you all the references. In fact, you can have my, my notes if you want. Thank you very Is much. okay? Because it's got all the references in thank there. Thank you very much. No worries, thank you. I think they're giving you the microphone. <laughs> Do you want to have a other question? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you for this level. So I wanted to, for two particular uh, occasions, which level it is. One was that Ananta Gopal was saying that when you remember your spiritual master, it's mostly with praying. So when you are, uh, you are chanting and you are praying intensely to Krishna and to the Holy Name to progress, what is that level? It can be at any level. Because praying is not necessarily the same as actually, it's not quite the same as Rupa or Guna, Smaranam, etc. So, I, so even a beginner can pray to their spiritual master and they're very intensely mm -hmm. calling. But that, that's, that can happen at any stage. It's not a specific level. And uh, the second question is also uh, connected with uh, sometimes when we are overloaded with the service that we are trying to do for to please Krishna and the Guru and everything, and the service comes to the mind when we are chanting, you know, like, and that is on the Vaikari work or what, uh, because it's not, you're not co connected with the Holy Name, but with the... Yeah, it can be. See, the, the thing about that is, it's better than nothing. To, if you're gonna re If you're going to remember something, Better to remember service in something very mundane, yeah. But still, actually, when the chanting is going on, the remembrance should be the chanting, and the, and the Lord if we're at the more advanced stage, yeah, like that. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe one more on the lady's side. I can see this hand up. Forgive me if I didn't see your hands, just because there's so many people in the room. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, I have a question when you said, uh, when we chant with offenses, so yes. there is a dialogue which Krishna see all of what, are, what we are doing. Yes. yes, and you mentioned also if we stay in that level so we don't go on that journey, journey mm -hmm. then uh, we can get something we don't know. Yeah, I can, can elaborate you? on that. It's a good yes. point. So this, is, um, so this is actually some points made by Jiva Goswami on that. So he makes the point... Let's be very clear. We all generally started at Vaikari Vak, which is offensive chanting, Nama Parad. However, it's explained that if one does not try to improve, if, if, if as the devotees, if we purposefully just continue on that level and don't try to chant attentively, a few things will happen. Jiva Goswami says, well, first of all, that means it's really heavily Nama Parad, first of all. And Jiva Goswami says it will lead to crookedness, it will lead to faithlessness, attachment to the things that destroy faith in Krishna, and it will make one slack in their devotional service to the point, and this is very interesting, he says it will bring us to the point where we will take pride in our devotional accomplishments. Yeah? So what that means is, you, you, will, you will see yourself as a devotee based upon externals. Right? You'll think that you're a great devotee based upon the externals of what you've done, as opposed to the actual progress, the actual, inter the actual genuine progress you made in your relationship with Krishna. Yeah? So that's actually one of the things that, he's, that he actually t um, said. Um, yeah. So these are all the effects that come if, if, one, if one is slack in their, in their endeavor to move forward in their chanting. Yeah, you'll become, you'll become, you will see, you will start to think that devotional advancement is based upon externals rather than actual uh, genuine development of relationship with Krishna and love of Krishna. And you will judge other devotees in the same way. Yeah. Thank you very much.
Um, okay. Can I have one question? You have one more? Okay, <laughs> yeah, since you got the microphone. I, mean, I, I just have a question regarding okay. remembering Krishna. So how do we know that this is real Krishna came to my mind or it's just my mind? Yeah, so there's two things about that. You actually, so when, for example, let's say we're chanting and the form of the deity comes into our mind, by, let's, if you do it by your endeavor, that's one thing, yeah? If it comes spontaneously, and it's, then it has to be, if it comes spontaneously and stays like that consistently, it has to be the mercy of the Lord. Okay, it's considered the mercy of the Lord. Because even if, if I visualize the deity, that doesn't actually mean that, I have, that I've got the, the deep mercy of the Lord to make the Lord manifest in that way. He only manifests by his own desire, ultimately. Yeah? So if I use my mind, if I use my mechanical ability, that's one thing. But if he chooses to come, that's, that's, the real, that's the real presence of the Lord. In other words, the consistent remembrance of the Lord only happens ultimately by his grace. Okay, you, It's actually not something that anyone can force, even if we visualize whatever. But if it's the consistent remember, um, you know, appearance of the Lord in the, in the mind, internally consistently it only happens by his grace yeah. so it stays longer it's it consistent yeah you need his mercy for that to happen but the endeavor should be there to attract his mercy both things is that okay yeah, thank you. okay um microphone to this side any questions on this side here we go okay yeah please yeah that's fine that's fine Oh, and uh, what? How do we chant to Krishna? If just how does the way he does it? How does Krishna tell people that if he chants, does he say anything? I didn't quite make does out your Krishna, question. If Krishna tells people chanting more, does he let's do it? Does he let's do chanting? I don't think I quite heard, but let me, I'll just say something and you can let me know if it does answer your question because I'm a little bit unclear. It was your question that if we chant, does, le- does something happen or does less happen? Was that your less question? Less happen. Not necessarily. I mean, to be honest, when you chant, a few things can happen. If we mm. practice chanting mm. properly, then we will get more of a taste for chanting. That's the first thing. And if we ch- practice chanting properly, we accelerate through the different stages. So we, we come to see ourselves. So as we said, to use the analogy with, this, with, the wood, with the firewood, first the smoke comes up. That's our anatas. We start to see all the, all the impurities. Lust, anger, envy, pride, greed, illusion. We see, you really see that. If we keep progressing beyond that, the spark comes, madhya mavak. That gives the, the gyan shakti. We start to see things more clearly the spiritual knowledge becomes more manifested. So the Gyan Shakti increases. If we keep practicing, we come to Pasyanti Vak, where the Icha Shakti becomes stronger. So our spiritual desires become stronger. Our, our original desires to really serve Krishna become strongly awakened. And then when we come to the pure stage, where it's Paravak, then we come to the full illumination of our relationship with Krishna. And we, and we remember Krishna's pastimes spontaneously. I'm not sure if that fully answered your question, but that's what I can make of what you were asking. Yeah? Okay. Thank you very much for... Okay. Any last questions? Okay, maybe one more from this side, please. And I should give you guys a break before the next class. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. So, question is around severity between aparads and the vaks that you've got, and the, and the vaks that you listed, the four four lower stages, four levels, four okay. levels. So, this is severity. So, we learned a lot about the aparads earlier with um, Jankina Prabhu last night. So, does the severity become intense on the different levels, or is it still the same? Uh, is there no. any any? I, and Nishta, one is not chanting Nama Parad. So when you get to Madhya Mavak, it's not Nama Parad. Nama Parad takes place before Madhya Mavak. Yeah? So Nama Parad is to do with Vaikari Vak. 
when one comes, when one makes further progress, they're not chanting offensively anymore. And if they keep doing that, then they just continually move on that particular journey. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So we'll stop there. Um, I'm tempted to give you an exercise just to think about this. For tomorrow's seminar, I'd just like you to think about times in your spiritual life where you um, were chanting and it was really, you were relishing it. It was really positive, strong, attentive. And just think about what were some of the circumstances, what were some of the things that you were doing devotionally, etc. What were some of the circumstances in your life at that time that may have helped you to chant in that particular way? Okay, and we'll discuss and explore this more, this theme more tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much. Shiva Prabhupad ki jai, Sri Nam Prabhu ki jai, Janitai Gopramanandi, Hari Hari Bo.